Originally from Mesopotamia, the olive is cultivated all over the Mediterranean basin. The olive tree is a symbol of wisdom, peace and fecundity and is found in the Drome to the south of Nil and in the Baronies, which is the northern extremity of its culture. In the Baronies, there are around 4,000 lots and about 260,000 trees. Today, the ground they grow on is between 300 and 600 meters. In spite of its reputation that the olive tree is immortal, it is in fact fragile. It fears the frost and its flowers the rain. Nowadays, the olive tree competes with the vine and the apricot Grove is the most profitable culture. The little village of La Roche sur le Bouy in the Menon Valley steadies its houses on a rocky spur. All around on steep slopes exposed to the sun, the olive tree is omnipresent with the tonche, one of the varieties of olives. Here the olive harvest begins on the Feast of St. Catherine on the 25th of November and finishes at the end of January. The olives are picked by hand and let fall into a basket attached to a shoulder strap. There are two other ways of picking. The fruit is made to fall by shaking the branches by hand or with a vibrator. In both cases, large nets are spread under the trees to catch the olives. The use of long poles is outlawed lest it marks the olives which are destined for making AOC oil. One man harvests at least 70 to 80 kilos per day. The tonche is a black olive with a crumpled skin. With that we make AOC nuance in two ways. The big ones are kept for eating and we make the oil with the little ones. The nuance oil is made with la tonche. It's a very precise oil, that's to say it's very fine oil, very sweet and very subtle and only comes from this region. After that, we conserve them. That's to say, we put them in barrels of salted water for four months. After that, you can keep them as long as you want. It's delicious. <laughs> it's delicious. I didn't want to say that. It's delicious and what you call a natural olive. Those olives there, once they're in the brine at the end of four months, they're taken out when you need them and you season them with herbe de Provence, garlic, pepper and anything you want. And from that moment you have aromatic olives. Once they are picked, the olives are taken to the mill within four days of their picking. This is an obligation if you want to get the extra virgin oil label whose acidity must not be more than 1%. After four days, the olives risk fermenting and increasing the risk of acidity in the oil. At moulin sur Ouvres in the Chauvet mill, they still make oil in the artisan way. The old real tennis court of the Chateau Moulin, dating from the 13th century, serves for the cold press room. Coal pressing gives a mixture of oil and water which are stored in vats called hopes. Once in the mill, the first stage is to grind the olives under the wheels. You have to allow a little under half an hour of milling so that the pulp and the nuts are sufficiently crushed before we put the mixture into the drum where it stirs continuously whilst it waits to be put on the mats for squeezing the oil. Why is it stirred continuously? So that it stays well mixed while it waits for the trolley to take it on the mat to the press. We start with a large metal disc at the bottom to get things even. Then four mats laden with olive paste, then another metal disc and so on until there are at least a hundred mats, which represents about 300 kilos of olives, and then we press them here.
The Roman bridge, a masterpiece of 14th century architecture, spans the two banks of the Eagle River. On the other side lies Nyons, capital of the olive, and offers two oil mills from the 18th and 19th centuries. Olive oil is very good for the health, monsieur. It's a medicine. You recommend a glass every morning. Alors, un petit verre d'huile d'olive, non pas un verre. Well, a little glass of oil, not a big glass. One mustn't exaggerate. A spoon of olive oil in the early morning. It's very good for the intestines and the bladder. Voilà. The scortinerie of Nyons has survived the misfortunes of the olive workers. Today, Alan Fert uses the machines invented by his great grandfather for making carpets. Here's a traditional scrotin. One puts the olives in this pocket and they are crushed in the press and the oil passes through it. It's made mechanically because my great grandfather had the idea and invented the first machine to weave it. He looked for all kinds of material which would be more solid. He tried hemp, he tried aloe fibers and coconut fibers. In fact, he proved that the coconut was the most interesting because the fiber was the most resistant mechanically and which didn't rot. My great-grandfather had a big success at the beginning. When things were going well, he was selling all through the south of France and also in Algeria and Tunisia. My grandfather continued business until 1956 when there was a disaster in the region. There was a great frost. It froze very suddenly and very hard and brought about the destruction of the olive trees. For six years there was not one olive harvest all through the south of France. With the olive groves destroyed, it goes without saying that the demand for scrotin was nil and the olive mills closed, so he had to have an idea very quickly. He noticed that people used old scrotin as doormats, and so he said, we're going to make doormats. The village of Coucouron is representative of a Provençal town. At the centre lies the church of Notre Dame de Beaulieu, built in the 13th century and surrounded by medieval houses built on circular streets. The imposing reservoir is surrounded by 200-year-old plane trees, dates from 1403 when it was used to power flour mills. The clock tower or belfry, built in the 16th century, a rectangular tower constructed on a stone tower, is being rebuilt. The clock is mechanized and the clock face, dated 1892, replaced the painted face from 1546. We have just stopped the building falling down, becoming a ruin. We are trying to repair it the maximum. The restoration stops there because a stone like that should be changed to have that. That's what gives it its charm. All these imperfections. It's the charm of the place. 
That's the stone of the region. Yes, yes. What's that? It's lime mortar. Lime mortar. Lime is sand. Three parts sand, one part lime. It's from burnt chalk. The Romans used it. The Romans? The Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians already used it. It was the oldest binder that was used until the arrival of cement in the 1850s. Because that was when François Vicker introduced cement, and it was sold industrially at Portland, England. That's where Portland cement comes from. The lime lets the water breathe, that's to say the water goes in and comes out, which is not the case with cement, which makes a waterproof barrier which causes the facades to break down. One never puts a cut stone in cement because the water can't go from one stone to another, and when it is blocked by the joint there will be a damp patch which will start a degradation between one stone and the next. What a team! The blacksmith's work of the clock tower at Coucheron was done in the workshop of Hubert Jourdain, locksmith, companion of honour, and erstwhile provost of the House of Companions of Nîmes, specialists in embossing metal. It is here that the great cross, conceived as a processional cross, and the pennant are restored to their former glory. The globe, pierced in many places by hunters' bullets, leaves the workshop resplendent. The little crosses and pennants are remade completely, and each keeps its naivety and individual character. Going by the back roads from one village to the next, one discovers the rich patrimony of the Drome in the church of Gad Adma. From its terrace, the valley of the Rhone is laid out before you. Not far away is the Chateau of Grignon, the biggest Renaissance chateau in the southeast, where Madame de Sévigny stayed many times. But the Drome is also the country of the black truffle called the Perigord, or the Tubo Melanosporum, known in Provence as the Black Diamond or the Rabas. Highly considered, it is prized for its taste and rustic smell, both strong and subtle. The harvest is traditionally done with a pig, but today it's done more often with a dog. Come on, come look. You see, you see, that's very good, Ixia. You depend on the nose of a dog. You depend on it for smelling. I can smell nothing, absolutely nothing. You need a remarkable sense of smell. It's not a job for me. Come, come, come over here. Oh la la. Oh la la. They are far from the trees. It's magnificent. Lola, Ixia, Lola. That's very well done. 
It doesn't smell. Oh, no, not much. That's very good, Ixia, here. Good girl. Good girl. Oh, la la, my fingers. That's very good, la la. That's very good. You... You find a big truffle. Ixia, 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 go on, go on. When an acorn germinates in an area where there's lots of spore, it makes its own microorganism. So to help nature, because there's less and less wild game, there is less balance in nature than before. We microize the trees, that's to say we put the microorganisms on the trees that grow well, and then let them germinate in a place where we gather truffles, the tuber melisporum. The microization of the tree is done by the germination of the acorn, that's to say the little green germ leaves the acorn, the seed of the chestnut, there are also seeds of pine trees that are capable of microization. It is the most sensitive moment for microsizing the root. The microization is like a burn. When you burn your hand, for example, if you don't look after it, you're going to have lots of blisters, and microization is like that. So the blisters infect themselves. It's an infection, an infection which is not harmful to the trees. Once the roots have been microized, the tree gets bigger, and each year the roots grow further from the tree, and they find other spores in the soil. When they meet the spores, up, the truffle is born. So this phenomenon happens in the month of May. If the month of May is very hot and humid, very many truffles are born. It's called the birth of the truffles because the fecundation is good. And sometimes, very rarely, we find, if you really want to know, in a square meter under a tree, you can find 50, 60, sometimes 80 truffles in a square meter. One sees them very well because the little red lentils are attached to the root. The tree feeds them until around the 1st of July. From the beginning of July, it doesn't have any further contact with the truffle. The truffle cuts its umbilical cord and looks after itself after that. In the total production of truffles in France, it is our region, the south of France, which produces 60% of the national production. Is it the Perigord truffle here? It's the same variety, the tuber melanosporum. It comes from Perigord, from here, and Italy, Spain. They're all the same variety. On the other hand, Italy has other truffles. They have the tuber menatum, the white one. You know, the white truffle of Alba. But that's another variety we don't have in France. But the trees are always oak. Yes, amongst truffle producers, we always use oaks, but there are beech trees, birch, you have nut trees, the chestnut, coniferous trees like the cedars of Lebanon and the Atlas cedar and the Austrian pine. Here in this region we have a market every day in the surrounding villages and on Saturday we have Riche Orange, the biggest market in the world. The truffle market is held at Riche Orange on Saturday morning from mid-November until mid-March. This year is very poor for truffles. In the years when we have truffles, we sell between 1,000 and 1,200 kilos every Saturday. And what's the price today? They say the price starts at $500 a kilo, but right now I don't know. It's really the black diamond. Yes, it's truly a black diamond. A hundred and fifty. Are you satisfied? Yes, I'm satisfied.
For half a century, on the third Sunday in January, Saint Antoine's Day, the patron saint of truffle cultivators, at the church in Richerange, a mass is celebrated dedicated to the truffle. In attendance are the Brotherhood of the Knights of the Black Diamond in mighty pomp. Once the service is over, the crowd repairs to the town square where the truffles, which have been donated during the service, are weighed and auctioned off. All the money raised is given to the parish. We have 60 francs for the man in the green coat. 130, 140, 140, down to you, 140. 283, 283, 283, three times. Sold to you, sir. Five tuba melascorum of the first class of 100 grams. We start with that. 70. 300. In Carpentras, the truffle season begins under the sign of St. Cephrian, patron saint of the Carpentras truffle. Are you passionate about truffles? Do you like them? Completely, they're magic. It's wonderful like this when their perfume fills the room. Carpentras is the only market in France which has rules which ask the people to sort their truffles because there are 50 different kinds. All that I've shown you is between the Brumel and the melanoma. It may not be the biggest in quantity, but it's the most important for quality. So is it time or is it? The market is open.
How much is that? 300 grams? No, 340. Speciality of the house. Fricassee de Saint-Jacques au trou. You start with fresh Saint-Jacques, which you sauté in butter, with a drop of olive oil, salt, pepper, garlic. Brown them in the pan. You put in the cream and let it reduce, and at the last minute, grate the truffles on the top. It's excellent. And the heat of the dish itself cooks and diffuses the aroma of the truffles. The truffle is wisdom with drunkenness.